Once again, I'd like to thank the uh, leadership and eldership of the church for this very kind invitation. I'm so blessed, so privileged, so honored, and I just want to give God all the praise. And also, I'd like to congratulate all the newly elected uh, elders, elders of this church. Praise God for you guys, and I believe you're going to experience a great anointing, great power of God working through you as He works in you. Amen. I just want to honor our dear brother Dennis. Uh, I mean, he's one of the most unpretentious person, pastor. And each time when I fellowship with him, there's always so much encouragement. And I just want to thank God for the work that he's doing in Siam Reap. He's going to be there to reap a lot for the Lord and the harvest of the Lord. And so we just want to praise God for that, right? So. I mean, it's so wonderful to really to see what God is doing, signs, wonders, miracles, and I just want to praise God for Dennis, Charlene, and together with his, their families, right? Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray that you will speak to us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will just lead us and guide us and direct us. And Lord, I just come before you, Lord, as your vessel. Lord, I come before you cleansed and covered by the blood of Jesus, even as I avail myself to speak, I pray that every single word would be from your throne, O God, be from you, Lord. I pray, O God, that, Lord, that your word that goes forth will not return to you void, but will accomplish your purposes, O God. We just want to thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was once a, you know, a village, and uh, there is this king who's got a very beautiful daughter, but somehow... You know, the king wants his daughter to marry well, to marry someone who is brilliant, someone who is clever, someone who is really macho, someone who is full of uh, uh, boldness and bravery and, you know, the full works, you know, the brain and the brawn, right? So, and so he wanted someone like that. And so he thought of an idea. He says that whosoever is able to swim across this river that was infested by many deadly crocodiles will be able to receive not just the hand of my daughter, but half of my village that I'm ruling over. And so days went by, people would gather at the riverbanks and, and they waited and waited. No one actually dared to jump into the river, swim across the river so that he can win the hand of the daughter, the, the village chief's daughter. And uh, no one did that. And it was for days and days and days. And, and one day, all of a sudden, I heard a splash. And he saw this guy running and I mean, swimming and swimming and swimming with all of his ability. And he made it to the other side. All the crocodiles were so fearful of him. He got up. Everybody was just applauding and saying, oh, this guy is so brave. This guy is excellent. He's worthy to receive the hand of the daughter. And so the village chief came up to him for a press interview. What made you do that? He says, wait till I get the guy who pushed me into the river. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that God is calling every single one of us, but sometimes we need that push from someone so that we can get into the river and do the things that God is calling us to do. Right? Right? Very often we are thrown into the deep end and we are doing things which it is really blind blowing. I don't think years ago Dennis would have imagined himself in Siam Rip doing all this work and, and things like that. But he is doing that with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He's doing that because he's responding to the call of God, because the Lord has laid that upon his heart, and he's willing to just say, I'm willing to sacrifice and bring my whole family to be there where God wants them to be. And often after doing all these things, we can see God extending and expanding ourselves, our lives, and, and you can't imagine the capacity and the capability often we find that it's really beyond us. Then we know that it is really supernatural. Then we know that it's the power of God manifesting in our lives. It's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. Amen? The Lord has empowered all of us to do the mighty works of Jesus. And the Lord said, greater works, you'll be doing this. We just want to thank God for that. I also would like to honor Pastor Andrew. Is that, is that you? Yeah, because wear mask, wear cap, cannot see. Yeah. 
This is the only time they can do that in a bank okay, and ask for money. <laughs> I really like to honor this dear brother and his wife, Grace, and I mean, let's, let's honor them, shall we? <laughs> Looking after all the, all the children and, and things like that. So it's really beyond us. I'm, I'm sure you can ask him, never in his wildest dreams would he imagine him doing these things, reaching out to so many people, touching so many lives. And, and I believe when the Lord just asks us to do the mighty works, the Lord is going to empower us. And really, just now we have heard the bottom line is the love. I remember one time we were in Palawan. How many of us know where Palawan is? It's a long, narrow strip of island on the western side of the uh, Philippines. It's, it's beautiful. You, you know, I baptize people there, chest deep, I can see my sandals. And, and also you can see a lot of uh, terrorists at the southern part also. And also, we were crossing rivers, trekking through mud, and the mud was knee deep. And I was, we were trekking with a team, and, and it was a Saturday evening. And I mean, I got a bit of night blindness. The sun was setting. I don't see very well when it's dark. And, and when, when you walk through, and just, I just asking myself, I was asking God, it's Saturday. I could be at home having steamboat with my family. What on earth am I doing here? You know, what's the worst thing is that you have wet underwear because you cross through rivers and then you feel sticky, oily, and then you're tired. And I mean, you just feel like shouting at somebody. And I'm saying, I mean, I'm human, okay? So, so we reached the village and we stayed in the all-star hotel because it's a tribal house. You see all stars up there. <laughs> and say, okay, guys, uh, let's call it a day. Let's rest, sleep, and whatever, you know. So we slept. And then the next morning, we woke up. We had our devotions as a team. And we started singing the power of love. And as we sang that, the Holy Spirit just came and ministered. The reason why we are there it's because of the power of God's love. Nothing else, nothing to shout about, nothing to be, you know, to be proud about. It's because of what the Lord has done in our lives so that He can do it through our lives. Amen. I'm sure all of us are very familiar with this uh, story. Everybody, somebody, anybody, nobody. So there were global missions to be handled and Everybody was sure somebody would do it. Anybody have done it, could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. So at the end of it all, we need to ask ourselves, am I that somebody who is supposed to do, anybody can do it, and, but yet I became that person that didn't do anything. So commonly it's said that there are three kinds of people in this world. There are people who make things happen, there are people who wait for things to happen, and there are people who don't know what happened, <laughs> right? So which category are we in? Either we are people who make things happen, wait for things to happen, or don't know what happened, right? So today we're going to talk about Nehemiah chapter 1. And the Lord has laid this message upon my heart for this church. You see, when we, when we are seeking the Lord for a message, it's not just understanding the Word and receiving the revelation from God, but also to understand the times and the seasons in which the church is going through. So, if some of us, you feel that this is not totally connected with you because you are here just to receive a word of encouragement or, you know, you want to have some booster, whatever, I mean, fine, I hope you can bear with us as we go through this as the Lord wants to impart this to City Missions Church. And I believe God wants to do this to encourage us for the next lap. At the last mis uh, meeting that we were here, the last message, I talked about rising up. Can you remember? We are talking about taking ownership. We are talking about moving into the place where God wants a season of change and, and everything. And I believe building on what has really been shared, what has been said, what has been preached, we want to talk about the call to rebuild. 
And Nehemiah is a very interesting book. He was a cup bearer. How many know was a cup bearer? A cup bearer is one who bears the cup. So, so he goes to the king and he offers all the cups and everything. But more importantly, that he's a food taster. And he would just uh, eat whatever food that is being prepared for the king so that just in case, if anyone puts poison into that particular dish, this guy will get it first, right? So we know that he is very responsible and he's at a position where the king trusts him very, very much because unfortunately, King Artaxerxes, his father, Xerxes, actually died in the bedroom chamber. And so we know the kind of fear and anxiety the king would have. What if someone just put some poison and then, you know, he will poison me and, and things like that. So we know that Ezra was the cup bearer. He was also during the time of Nehemiah. Sorry, Nehemiah was the cup bearer. It was also the time of, about the time of Ezra. Ezra was the scribe and also Nehemiah was the cup bearer. What we can see here, the two common traits that we can see in the lives of Ezra and Nehemiah is that they are people of prayer and they are people of the word. They are not some particular pastors or you know, clergymen or you know, um, things like that. And so he was serving the king, Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, in a city of Susa. So we all know that Israel was in exile, and many of them stayed in Babylon. And he heard about the dilapidation of you know, the city of Jerusalem, and, and he was called to come back to serve and to build and rebuild the church, I mean the, the walls. So Nehemiah wasn't a clergyman. And so he wasn't like working in the king's court, but I mean, he was working in the king's court, like some MNC. He's not in full-time ministry. How many of us are not in full-time ministry? All of us here, right? Except me. I'm, I'm part-time. So. so praise God, you're in overtime ministry because you have your own work to do and then you are serving in the church. So we know that all of us, we need to just do the things that God wants us to do. And I remember my godson told his parents that, you know, when I grew up, I want to be like Pastor Dennis. So they were so terribly impressed. And says, oh, you want to be called in a full-time ministry? You want to serve the Lord? And, oh, wonderful, you're such a good boy. Why? Because he only works on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> so the lessons that we can see here is that Yahweh can call anyone and anyone can just respond to him. Someone who has got a passion for the Lord. And also the power of prayer, as you look through the entire book of Nehemiah, you will see the consistency of prayer, and more importantly, the power of Yahweh, and also provision, the miraculous supernatural supply. Of course, we can anticipate and expect persecution that happens, that whenever we do the work of the Lord, perseverance and protection, and uh, we, sorry, presence and protection, and of course, the promises of God fulfilled. Let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. I'll just go through some parts and then uh, we'll cover the rest later on. It says in verse 1, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekaliah, came to pass in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates were burned with fire. So it was, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So it was during this time that he was called by the Lord. Who is Yahweh calling? Is he calling you to do the works of ministry, to do the works in rebuilding the walls, to do the work in which we can participate in this extension and expansion of the kingdom of God? Is God calling you? I believe God is Giving this invitation to every single one of us is only up to us as to whether we want to respond to that 
or not. And so the question we want to pose to ourselves is that, is God calling me? What am I supposed to do? How can I take ownership? How can I participate in this church? If the Lord has led me into city missions, then I think I have to do something in contributing towards the growth, in contributing towards the development, to contributing towards the extension and expansion of God's church here in City Missions Church. Amen? And we know that God is calling all of us. Just imagine for a moment, Nehemiah, this person will be remembered for eternity, for the things that he has done, for how he has responded to the Lord, how he has given his life to God and to participate in what the Lord has called him to do. And there are many others in the Bible, even nameless people. There's this great evangelist who is a Samaritan woman. We don't even know her name. Maybe it was Lulu or something because, you know, her background. So anyway, sorry, pardon me. So anyway, she went back and the whole entire village came to know the Lord because she was the great evangelist telling others about uh, the, the, the villages about Jesus. Amen. So, we know that God can just use anyone. Nobody knows the name of the young man who gave up five loaves and two fish, but he's going to be remembered for eternity. And also there are many others, like the leper who returned to, to give thanks to Jesus, or even the four men who helped the paralytic that bashed through the, 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 the roof and sent this man down to Jesus. And all these are nameless people, and the Bible records all these in such a manner is to just remind us that we don't have to have that name to be that person in which God can use. We can just be that nobody, but yet we can be that somebody in order to do whatever God has called every one of us to do. And so when I was reading this, uh, this passage, this is the inspiration that God has given to me. It says here, sorry, it's very, very Fine, okay, this is actually taken from the Israel Science and Technology Directory, talking about the different uh, months of, uh, instead of January, February, March, April, you have all this, uh, like Kislev, uh, Tevet, and Shivat, and so on and so forth. It says here, it came to pass in the month of Kislev. I think this is very important for us to <coughs> know all this detail, simply because it was fulfilled. It came to pass. We need to always remind ourselves that whatever time and season that God has set for every one of us, we need to follow in accordance to the times and seasons, right? So it came to pass in the month of Kislev in the 20th year. 20th year, if you refer to chapter 2 verse 1, it says the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' rule that he was serving there and in the citadel, which is the fortress, is usually high on a hill, so they have a you know, vantage view and, and so that to be protected from all the oncoming enemies and so on and so forth. So we need to know the times and the season. And the reason why this is so specifically written is because it's a genuine exact record of a specific date. So it's not a story that is plucked out of thin air or someone's imagination once upon a time, you know. You know, now my granddaughter will always ask me, Grandpa, you need to tell me a story. I says, okay, I'll tell you a short story. Once upon a time, the end. Okay. <laughs> then she says, oh no! <laughs> okay. The genuine rec exact record of a specific date is so important because we know that these things actually happen in the accounts of history. Right? We know that God has got specific moments for different, different things. And also, times and seasons are very important in the sight of Yahweh. We can see in uh, Matthew chapter 16, there are people who pride themselves, who say that, hey, I know all the things that are happening, but what's the big deal? We can see this in uh, Matthew chapter 16. We read from uh, verses 1 to 4. He says, He answered and said to them, When it's evening, you see, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites! You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. 
So we know that God is actually rebuking these people who knows, seemingly know all the signs and of the times and yet they are not doing anything about it. So when we look at the signs of the times today, what do we see? We see what's happening in Matthew chapter 24 or Luke chapter 21, that there are wars and rumors of wars and, and all these things, all the turbulence, earthquakes and, and all the violent things that are happening. But what are we doing? Let's watch the Korean series, you know, it's so exciting. Let's, let's continue to follow and follow and follow. But there are many people who are perishing. I mean, I'm saying this not to guilt trip anybody because I watch TV also. But yet at the same time, we need to reach out and touch the lives in which God has put across our path. What are we doing with all these things that are happening? And also it's important for us to know the time because it shows us how long it took them to rebuild. And we know it's a miracle of all miracles. Rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and the gates took them only 52 days. I mean, you try to renovate your house, it tell you it's at least three months or six months. And with the COVID delay and they say no supply and no labor, and I mean, it takes a long time. But within 52 days, the walls of Jerusalem were completely rebuilt. All the gates were totally restored. You know, the gates are all very symbolic because all of us have got gates in our lives and we need to be very watchful over the gates of our lives, our eye gate, our ear gate, our mouth gate and everything because all these can affect us, our innermost being. So we need to be very watchful. And the walls protect them from the harms of the enemy. So the question we're going to ask ourselves is, what time is it now? Let's say this together, harvest time. Harvest time. The Bible tells us that we are in the days of the latter rain. And the latter rain is for the preparation of harvest. And we know that this is harvest time. That we need to bring souls into the kingdom of God. We need to just bring them before the coming of the Lord. I mean, all these things are happening. It's so wonderful. The, all the teachings on the feast, Yom Kippur and everything. I think it is really important for us to know the times and the seasons that we are in so that we can do whatever God has called us to do. I mean, just to share how simple it is to reach out and bring someone to Christ. I was having lunch in Pekio Hawker Centre. You know, a fantastic place to eat lunch. And uh, this wonderful Indian curry, I tell you, is the fish curry, the one that is a bit tangy and spicy and, and I mean, <laughs> let's not get there. Okay. So there was this elderly lady with, uh, I think it was a schnauzer. I says, uh, can I sit here? Can I join you? She says, oh, sure. And of course, the Lord's prompting is, I better share the gospel with her. And so in it, I just start with a small talk. Hey, how's the dog? What do you do? And uh, how do you groom the dog? And blah, blah, blah. And eventually I ask her, do you go to church? She says, yeah, I've tried once, you know. And I say, how was it? And to cut the long story short, I ask her this pointed question. Where would you go when you leave this world? She says, I don't know. I says, we all need a passport, right? You want to go traveling, you need a passport. And so the passport is salvation, is Jesus. The only way to heaven, to be with Him for eternity, to have this place called paradise, is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the next thing I know is I was saying the sinner's prayer with her and she accepted Christ. What I'm trying to say is that we are in harvest time. It's time to reap in all these people into the kingdom of God and to win them for Jesus. Amen? We need to just share and to reach out and to tell others and to bring them into the kingdom of God. What kind of person is God calling us? Is Yahweh calling us? You know, there are many people just waiting for you to share the gospel with them. We see this first point of Nehemiah. It was, he, was, he was a person of conviction. He loves the Lord. We can only be interested in the things and the ministry of God when we begin to love the person of God. Can you say amen to that? When you start loving the Lord with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, the best test to that is whether we love our neighbor as the way we love ourselves. If we can say, Lord, I love you so much, but yet we are not even bothered with 
I mean, I mean, not a guilt trip again, coming for a prayer meeting or, you know, participating in church events and things like that. I mean, really, and reaching out to other people. May the Lord just help us. So the Lord actually is looking for one who is willing to lay his life down in responding to what God has called to do. That Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived this cap uh, cap uh, captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, it is, and its gates are burned with fire. So when he heard this, I mean, if you were to be Nehemiah, if you hear something like this, okay, law, like that law, life goes on, you know. But instead of that, when he heard this, he responded to this call that God was putting into his heart, a conviction stamped out of care and concern because he was so concerned with the work of the Lord. And we know that this is developed through the relationship that we have with the Lord. When we have this intimate relationship with the Lord, that God would begin to put His business into our hearts. That we would say, yes, Lord, whatever that concerns you, concerns me. I want to reach out and touch these lives. And even the verse was quoted, that even when you're in prison, I'll visit you. Even when you're naked, I'll clothe you. Even when you're hungry, I'll feed you. Whatever it is, whatever need it may be, I want to participate in doing what you have called me to do. Are we people with conviction? Is God convicting us of things that God is calling us to do? And this is really the DNA of city missions. Involvement in missions. Because they heeded the call of God. So when you hear, let it affect your heart and therefore touching us so that we can heed to whatever God is calling us to do. So it's this whole process. You hear, it comes to your heart and you heed that you want to reach out and touch another person. That's what is the, the healing ministry is all about. When they see the needs of the people, they need to reach out to the people who are in need, who are in need of physical healing or emotional healing or spiritual healing. And this is what the you know, involvement in the community is all about, that we see the needs around us, that we hear the call, we are convicted, we want to do something, we want to respond to the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I want to touch these lives. Not that it's just to you know, satisfy our, our conscience, you know, just do a bit of good work, charity, and you know, so that we we'll be all happy. No. It's because when you enter in these places, I mean, you saw the pictures just now of that, that, that try or whatever the name was. I mean, what, what goes through your mind? Oh, uh, yeah, it's just another poor lady or whatever. But if in that situation, does it stir your heart into doing something that you want to work for the kingdom of God? So he was one who cared for the people of God, the city of God, the name of God, the reputation of God. And when he saw all these things happen, and there was this deep conviction that came into his heart. And we know that this church is going to be used so mightily. You know, I was worshipping the Lord just now to give all of us. I saw so many pictures of rings, um, nice rings, not suffering, you know, so, but rings, okay? So, and... I just sense the Lord saying that this is like a signet ring in which when the prodigal son came back to the father, the first thing is he put on him a robe and then sandals and then a ring. What does the ring signify? The ring signifies authority. It signifies sonship. It's like those days you don't have checkbooks, you know. Wherever you go, you want to buy something, you use the ring and then you, you sort of... Uh, you know, press in and then you embossed it or whatever it is and, and use as a collateral or, tran or transaction or whatever it is. And I believe the Lord is wanting to use this church and to remind this church that this authority has been given to every single one of us here. Can you say amen to that? Amen that God is raising us up to do the works with the authority that God has given to us. And so going to this marketplace, going to community services, going to all the different places, just like those days when tsunami hit Aceh, city missions responded. 
going to Nias and, and so on and so forth. And so this is really something that when you hear of this thing, conviction comes because it stems out of care and concern. And you translate all the conviction into intercession. And so it was when I heard these things, these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. You don't have to put up your hands. How many of us pray for the church ever so often? You don't have to put up your hands, okay? So, but this is your church. This is our church. How often do we pray for this church? I mean, I'm not trying to howl in or whatever. In preparing for the message, I have to pray for the church. It's not just praying, oh God, give me a message. I, I can do some good exegesis and uh, do some, you know, uh, expository preaching or whatever. I mean, that's, that's part of it. It's only a small part of it. But the main part of it is interceding for the church and to ask the Lord, what is the, the moment, uh, what, uh, what are they, where are they at right now? Right now, this church, why, where are they at and I need to meet the needs and to bring a word in season, an inspiration from God, a revelation, an insight, so that the needs of the church can be met and can be built up so that we can move to a new level or a higher level. It's not just come and dispense a message and share a few thoughts and, you know, give you a 3.7 and God bless you and see you next time. No, no. it's more than that. Because we know that God has placed this conviction into our hearts. It translates into intercession. What does it mean to intercede? To stand in a gap. To intercede is as though you are going through that situation. And then you feel it so deeply and you want to reach out to that person. It's just like this person hanging out of the, the balcony. And what do you do? Immediately you want to reach out and touch this person and pull this person back to safety. You won't say, hey, uh, don't let the wind strong or not. No. You won't ask, uh, hey, actually quite high, and you drop down, she'll die. You, know? you won't ask stupid questions like that, right? So we pray because we are desperate. We are in need. How many of us pray, hey, God, teach me uh, how to add 2 plus 2? Or God, teach me how to uh, SMS and type. I mean, all these are already second nature, so to speak. You know, some of us are so expert, you know, can, can type without looking, you know. Duk, 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 duk. I tried, la, but then become funny language. Huh? <laughs> People don't understand. But the reason why we pray is because we are in need. We are desperate. We want God's will to be done. We want to sense and understand what is God saying, what is God showing, what is God directing, what is really God's last say in a particular matter. We pray with desperation because it's a cry of helplessness. And the Bible tells us that he wept. How many of us pray until we weep? My friend was telling me he just went to KL and then he said that when he went there, he pumped petrol, he started weeping. <laughs> Full tank, V power, $60. <laughs> no, sing, sing dollars. $60, he started weeping. He came back to Singapore, pump petrol, also he started weeping. Oh, so expensive. How many of us weep? Jesus wept. It is really an emotion that, that stirs within our hearts that we really want to reach out and do something. When Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, he wept. He wept not because he was late, you know, he went four days later. He wept because he could associate with the, the heart of the two sisters, Mary and Martha. He could just sense the grief that was going through their hearts. So we weep because we have this deep sense that we want to do something. It's a cry of desperation. And he mourned because he was in such a condition. And then he went to fasting. Fasting is not a, a, a hunger strike. You know, God, I'm not going to eat. Huh? You know, you better answer. Huh? No, it's not a hunger strike. Fasting is to really come before the Lord in humility and dying to self. Because when we fast, it's actually death to our will. 
What stops us from going downstairs and eat one of the best nasi padang downstairs? Good, right? Downstairs, that one. Yes. <laughs> it's the will. That I surrender my will to you, Lord. And hence, I'm fasting. And of course, praying. What was his prayer? A very interesting prayer that he prayed. Very quickly. He says, And I said, I pray, O Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who, you, who love you and observe your commandments, Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant which I pray before you now, day and night. For the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and statutes nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you will cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. For these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cup bearer. So we see the pattern of prayer of Nehemiah. The first thing he did was to worship. The first thing he did was, he says, O great and awesome God, the Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. So we begin with worship. This is like the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. I mean, if I were to be Nehemiah, I would come with the shopping list prayer. Lord, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you supply this? Can you supply that? Can you just help me this? Help me that? Lord, please, this, this, this. It's always me, 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 me. Or it can also be a complaining prayer. Lord, why you just allow this to happen? Why you just, you know, you see all the enemies tear down all the things and, and Lord, you see the dilapidation of, of Jerusalem. Why, Lord, why, you know, why you just do all these things? Why am I going through all this suffering? Why am I going through all these difficulties? Why, why? <laughs> we also say, why, why? Tell me why. <laughs> anyway, we know that we go through all these prayers, but yet the first attention is really you are the awesome and great God. Of course, the confession. You begin to identify with the needs and the sin of the entire nation of Israel. He wasn't the one who sinned. He was a nice cup bearer. He was doing his duty. He was doing all the nice stuff, you know, running around in the palace and things like that. But he says, what do you say? I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. This is what we call an identificational repentance. We identify with the need, we identify with the sin, and we come before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive. Amen? So we just do that. And of course, the consequences of disobeying the Lord, not following His commandments, you all be scattered. And the city that was chosen, Jerusalem, Yerushalem, which is the city of peace, of Shalom, and also the claiming of promises. And all these has got to be translated to this word called action. You have your conviction, you have your intercession, and it leads to action. That all of us have to come into cooperation and collaboration. We see this in chapter 2, verses 1 down uh, 17 and 18. It says here, Then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God which had been good upon me and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let's say this together, let us rise up and build. Let's say this together, let us rise up and build. 
Then they set their hands to this good work. Can we say that together? Let us rise up and build. Every one of us is as important. You see, the problem is that many a times the old ones say, oh, let the young ones do. The young ones will say, let the old ones do because they've got more experience, they've got more maturity, or this, this. I mean, it's always that. Ding, 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 ding. It's Tai Chi, you know. And Misiam, Misiam. So we know that God is always calling us with that conviction that leads to intercession. And we need to rise up to take action with cooperation and collaboration. Let us rise up and build. You know, the response of Peter when he was told by the Lord to go to a particular place, you can see this in Acts chapter 10. Just go there very quickly and then I come back to uh, Nehemiah. Actually, um, there are so many things which you want to look at, uh, talk about in uh, Acts chapter 10. It says that uh, in verse 19, well, Peter thought about the vision because God gave him a vision. Rise, kill, eat. It's time for you to enjoy bakute. You know, you've been a kosher for too long. Just enjoy it. Bakute is very nice, you know, because they cannot eat pork. So they're saying, the Lord says, rise, kill, and eat. He says, no, 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 this is unclean. And, and the Lord says, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. All right? So in verse 19, the Lord, the Peter thought about the vision and the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore go and go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. To cut a long story short, they went, he went following these three men and went to the house of Cornelius. And when Cornelius saw Peter immediately, he fell down to worship him and he says, No, 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 please, please don't do that, you know. And so he explained and preached the gospel. And immediately, Cornelius and the whole household accepted Christ. An amazing thing is that before he could even finish preaching, they were, starting, they, were, they were speaking in tongues. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Right? Sometimes we think that we want to have order. Hey, hey God, uh, no, no, please, please. Today is, uh, you know, we have you know, 20 minutes of worship and then uh, 10 minutes of praise. And then after that, we have collection. And then... Hey, not time yet, Lord. Don't come. Uh, don't, don't don't move so mightily. Relax, you know. Just fill, finish your preaching first. I mean, let's not order God. I'm not saying don't have any order. Please don't get me wrong. We do the things that God has placed upon us to do, but we need to just follow the flow of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And go into the time where we can just experience what God is showing us. Just like in the life of Moses. When he was called, there were so many excuses. Some of us can be like Moses. You know, I, I, I have a short tongue. I cannot speak well. I cannot do this. I cannot do that. And how am I going to lead these people out? They won't listen to me. You know, when I go to Pharaoh, what am I going to tell him? You know, when I tell the people, what's your name? And, and I mean, you read the whole story in uh, Exodus. But I'd like to point to you a particular passage in Exodus chapter 15, which is a reminder for me uh, in my service yesterday. It says in actually, actually uh, Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and shall hold, and shall hold your peace. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. It's almost like God saying, why are you praying? Come on. Just do it. I've already given you the authority. I've already given you the power. I've already vested all this in you. Just do it. Just raise up your rod and bring the children of Israel over. And I believe God is saying to all of us today that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed us to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to, to recover your sight to the blind, and also liberty to the oppressed. What are we waiting for? When we go to a person, or do we pray, Lord, uh, should I witness, you know, it can be a bit uncomfortable, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit terrifying to tell somebody. 
I mean, if that's maybe the last time you're going to see the person, why not, right? So just do it. Just share to tell the person and tell them about the love of Jesus. And may the Lord just help us. And God is saying, why are you praying? Why do you cry to me? Just tell the Israel, the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand. Who is supposed to do it? Is it God? Or is it Moses? Moses. Moses has to do that. And then after that, in order to close the sea back, uh, in verse 26, the Lord said to Moses, stretch your hand over the sea and the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. Why can't, why can't God just do that supernaturally? You know, they cross, really cross, la, you know, they just cover it. La, no. But the Lord told Moses, look, lift up your rod again. Because God has given us the privilege to participate in all that He's doing. Amen. I mean, who am I? We are just, we are just that earthen jar, the earthen vessel. But it contains the treasure that God has placed into all of us. So we know that Yahweh is actually calling us. In these two, re- two cases of Nehemiah and Moses, that God is calling us to understand the identity that we have in the Lord. With the identity, it comes the authority and the power that He wants to release into our lives. When Moses called, when God called Nehemiah, the response of Nehemiah was, he wept, he mourned, he prayed, and he fasted. So let us come before the Lord. And when the Lord calls us, May the conviction just come upon our hearts that we want to do the things in which He's calling us to do. That that the Lord is just placing us into all those different areas of ministry. You know, after leading worship, you just realize that, yeah, actually, I'm anointed by the Lord to do that, right? After preaching, you realize, hey, yeah, maybe I can preach more because the Lord anointed me to do that. After teaching, you realize that, you know, the revelation just comes and flows and, and the Lord maybe wants me to do that. And, and maybe if you're an usher, you just realize your hand is just warmer and somehow softer and you're able to, you know, really reach out and extend and give a good welcome to somebody. I mean, the Lord is working in us and through us. The Lord loves to hear our prayer, but yet at the same time, He wants us to know who we are. Amen. I'd like to close this with this verse, the identificational repentance. Why is it so necessary? Before he even started anything, he began to identify with the needs of Israel. And he began to stand in the gap with this identificational repentance. Just like 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn their face and turn from and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. May I invite you to stand. How many of us want to identify yourself with this church? I would like to invite you, even if you want to kneel, you want to sit down, to come in this place of repentance. To identify with the church in asking God to forgive if there be any sense of offense, any sense of failure, any sense of disappointment, any sense of betrayal, whatever it may be. And after that, I'd like to invite some of the elders or some of the members that you are led by the Lord to stand in the gap, to pray, and to ask God for a breakthrough that the church can move on to a new level. Amen. I'll pray first. You know, can I be frank with this church? There are many pastors that came and left some good, some not so good. But I like to stand in a gap to seek for forgiveness. If there's any offense 
that has taken place when we left, that the Lord to forgive. Let's pray. Father, we just pray that you would forgive us, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have called us to rebuild. Lord, we thank you, O oh God, for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your steadfast love. And Father, even as we are reminded in Psalms 103, when Elder Allen started the service, to bless the Lord, O oh, our souls, and all that's within him, bless the holy name, and forget none of your benefits, who has forgiven us our sins, our iniquities, and heal us of all our diseases, Lord. Lord, in this solemn moment, we humble ourselves before you, Lord. We ask that you would cleanse and cover this entire church with your precious blood. We thank you, Lord, that City Missions Church is redeemed by your blood. Lord, I stand in the gap, O oh God, for this church. And also, perhaps even representing the pastors who came, who have served, and Lord, if then any one of us have got any sense of offense or any sense of hurt, Lord, we just pray that you forgive us, Lord. Cleanse us and forgive us, Lord. Wash us, O oh God. And Father, we pray that this church will not be bound by any entanglement, by any chains, O oh Lord. Lord, we pray that, Lord, that this church will not be stopped, O oh God, and hindered from going on to a new level, into the next level, into the place where you have prepared and the place that you have in store, the place that you have in mind for this church to go, Lord. Lord, I ask that you forgive, Lord of any offense that has taken place and cleanse us from any unrighteous thoughts or perhaps even unrighteous actions, Lord. Lord, I pray, O oh God, there be a new breakthrough for this church. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. If there anybody else want to continue praying, you can come to the front, take the mic, you can just pray and stand in the gap for the church. Thank you, Lord. Just feel free to come. You can be a member, you can be a leader, you can be an elder, whatever it may be, you can just come and just ask the Lord to cover and cleanse this church that we can move on and be free from all kinds of encumbrances, all kinds of hindrances, that we can just move on to the new level. Thank you, Lord.